for the honor of the reading of the Word of God. Uh, 1 Kings in chapter 19. Now there's uh, two titles for this evening's message. and uh, uh, They're Dying is Gain or It is Enough. And uh, I can't choose between the two. And Whatever applies to you and whatever may help you out in your life and where you may be at this point in time, uh, you can apply the appropriate title or maybe utilize both of them. Who knows? Dying is Gain or it is enough. First Kings chapter 19, you get there, let's stand. We honor the reading of the Word of God. Read verses 1 through 4 in your heart with me tonight. We'll ask the Lord's continual blessing upon the sermon, and then uh, we'll sit for just a little while. The Bible says in verse 1 of chapter 19 of First Kings, it says, Abraham, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, let the gods do to me and more also. If I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. He himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die. And he said, It is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my fathers. Heavenly Lord, we come before you this evening again, and we thank you, Lord, for the wonderful opportunity uh, to hear your word. We thank you for the opportunity to be back in church. We, we consider it a privilege, we consider it an honor uh, to be able to have a local assembly, Father, to come together one with another. So we pray tonight uh, that you would reach down with your precious hand but touch our hearts, dear God. Encourage us where we need it the most this evening. Lord, let us take your precious word and apply it into our hearts. Let us live the life, dear God, that you have called us there to. We love you now and we thank you, dear Lord, for all that you've done. In Jesus Christ's name, amen and amen. Thank you so much again for standing. Please be seated. Friend, the simple, simple part of this story here and part of this uh, record that we've been given in First Kings of Elijah when... Uh, this wicked queen Jezebel, a uh, vile creature that she was. Uh, she was married to uh, Israel's worst king of all time, King Ahab. And, and the Bible says that Jezebel stirred him up. So when you're a wicked king and, and you're stirred up by a wicked woman, well, you know, the results uh, obviously uh, are not good. Amen. But friend, and what we find here after this great and wonderful thing that had happened just moments before, maybe a day before, whatever it may be, uh, with the slaying of these prophets of Baal and the victory that happened on Mount Carmel, we find that Elijah, simply put, he's just ready to die. I mean, right here, alone in the wilderness, resting up underneath a Jupiter tree, he is just ready to die. We've always interpreted that it was a, the fear of the most wicked Jezebel that caused him a, a despair in his life. But I've got to present a question to you this evening. We always thought that it's because of Jezebel and her, her, evil, her evil life and her actions and her threat against Elijah's life. We always interpreted that it, that was why he was ready to die. But, but is that true? Is that the reason that he sat up underneath that juniper tree and said, Man, it's enough, Lord. I'm done. I'm no better than my fathers. It's enough. Take my life now. Keep reading with me in verses 5 through 8. And watch where the Bible says, And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, uh, He said, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals, and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him. And said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink. And when he was when 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 and when I'm sorry, and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights. We know he wasn't a Baptist, amen. Unto Horeb, the mount of God. So we see here that Elijah received strength in this one meal and in this one cruise of water. For 40 days and 40 nights. For one meal. Now that's a diet plan right there if you will. So let's keep reading. Look at verses 9 and 10. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. 
For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And notice what Elijah says. He says, I am jealous for the Lord God of hosts. You know, here's what we have. We have an instance that we're going to look at here in just a minute of the prophets of Baal being slain, destroyed, the challenge, uh, obviously won by God that we find there between who the righteous God would be. We find that Jezebel, who had slain all of the prophets nearly, and Ahab, this wicked king that he was, and we find that they want to seek Elijah's life. They want him for dead. And Elijah takes off, and he leaves his servant, goes another day's journey into the wilderness, and he sits up underneath the juniper tree and takes a little bit of a rest. And an angel comes and speaks unto him and says, Take and eat, here's food. And there she finds him a little meal there that's baking on the coal and a cruise of water laid by his head. And Forty days and forty nights transpire from that moment forward. And Elijah goes from, take my life, it is enough, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's, to these words right here. I am jealous for the Lord God of hosts. So why do you think Elijah was ready to die in the beginning? Well, let's, let's look at his life. Let's look at Elijah's ministry just uh, real quick, a quick synopsis of it. He prophesied the beginning and the ending of a three-year drought that occurred. We know that uh, three and a half years, no rain, no nothing fell there. Uh, it was a drought. It was a famine in the land. Uh, he besought the Lord that it would rain, and rain came. He instructed men how to locate a little cloud that appeared. Uh, he's one of the most famous of all prophets. We know by uh, prophecy that he'll be one of the two witnesses that come back. He's also one of the men on the Mount of Transfiguration with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's beside the point. He doesn't know that right now. We know with Elijah in 1 Kings 17 that, that food is brought to him by ravens. We know he prophesied against the backslidden Israel. We know that it, it's been recorded as to having a, the hand of the Lord upon him. We find that windows of food were multiplied unto Elijah. A widow's son was raised from the dead through the power and might of Elijah. We know the altar of the sacrifice is consumed by fire at the calling down by Elijah. We know the defeat of the prophets of Baal commanded by Elijah. And they were to be slain. If you look just a few verses up probably in your Bible there in 1 Kings 18, look in verse 36 with me. Uh, the Bible says, And it came to pass, uh, chapter 18, verse 36, And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art the God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God. And that thou hast turned their heart back again. Now if you mark in your Bibles. If you highlight in there. If you're taking notes. Mark those few last words of verse 37. Thou hast turned their heart back again. Verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell. And consumed the burnt sacrifice. And the wood and the stones. And the dust. And licked up the water that was in the trench. Now we know there were 12 barrels of water. In the trench that was dug around that altar, that sacrifice, mind you, those 12 barrels of water went in there at the conclusion of a three and a half year drought where there was no rain, no dew from heaven. Uh, that, that water that was poured into that trench that was licked up by the fire of God, I mean, that was liquid gold. Nobody had water like that. It wasn't from the Mediterranean Sea like many preachers want to preach. There was a time for that. For them to make that multitude of trips to fill that trench up. That was the provision that God had provided for the man of God throughout that period of drought. And there at the end, no one knew that drought was going to come over with until Elijah, or other than Elijah. And all that water was licked up. All these things transpired. So why after all of these years, why, after all of these mighty works and the obvious manifestations of God in God's power in Elijah's life, why does he say, take 
my life. It is enough. Can I say this to you this evening? Everything and everyone has a breaking point. Experts estimate that if a normal cassette, cassette tape, you guys under 30, cassette tape was this little rectangular thing that had little holes in it with some tapes that spool around it and sound actually recorded onto it, okay? And you stuck it into another little thing in your, in your radio in your car and it, it made this little sound when it popped in there and it whined a little bit and wheezed a little bit and music or words came out of the speakers, right? Those are called cassette tapes before MP3s and MP4s and, and um, CDs and DVDs and all this. But experts estimate that a normal cassette tape is played about a hundred times a year. And they say that the sound quality will deteriorate somewhat after about 10 years. They said but the tape itself will continue to play on. Did you know that a lightning bolt in itself only lasts 45 to 55 microseconds? The average running shoe is worn by the average runner on the average surface will last 350 to 500 miles. A hard pencil, remember those number two pencils we had to have in school in order to take the, the test with the scantrons? A hard pencil can write up to 30,000 words or draw a line more than 30 miles. Most ballpoint pens will draw a line 4,000 to 7,500 feet long. Leather combat boots. Leather combat boots have a wartime lifespan of six months. They have a peacetime lifespan of eight months because the army will always walk during war and peace. The projected lifespan of a baby born in the United States today is 71 years old, nearly double what it was at the end of the 18th century. Studies show married people live longer than those who remain single. Yet the lifespan, even in our own country here, the United Kingdom, is up to 78.6 years of age right now. And we know many people beyond that age, uh, just in our own village here. A group of subatomic particles, known as unstable hadrons, exist only for one one hundredth of a sextillionth of a second, 10 to the negative 23rd second. Less time than it takes for light to travel a single inch. And that's their lifespan. A 100 watt incandescent bulb will last about 750 hours. A 25 watt bulb will last 2,500 hours. And the number of times the light bulb is turned on and off has little to do with the lifespan of its existence. I, I wanted to refute that claim, but I had to research it. It was actually true. Did you know a 10 pound note has a lifespan of 36 months, and it has the average uh, has an average of 594 exchanges. Five pounds and tenors are the ones that are more commonly used and have a shorter lifespan. Practice footballs used by professionals last two to three days. Um, a play in life, perhaps for about five hours. The home team is required to bring 24 new balls to each game, and they last only about six minutes of playing time. You say, well, what in the world has that got to do with Elijah out there wanting to die? I said all that just to show you this, that no matter how good something is, no matter how well made something things, things are, everything has a breaking point. Everything reaches a point of deformation, if you will. So how do we address, how does that address Elijah's reason for saying, take my life? It's because of what he says first. He says, it is enough. Elijah had suffered great sacrifice, pain, frustration in the ministry. And yet they still sought his life. Israel continued to forsake the covenant of the Lord and tear down the altars of God and to destroy the men of God. And he had just had enough. He was a human after all. There's only so much a man can take. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more and labors more by the stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent in deaths oft of the Jews. Five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice was I shipwrecked. A night and a day I've spent in the deep. 
in journeys often in, uh, uh, in perils of water, in perils of water, in perils of my own country, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils amongst false brethren. He said, in weariness and painfulness, and watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fast and often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Paul went through so many persecutions. I am incredibly convicted when I, I complain about something. Convicted beyond belief. I catch myself. I caught myself just earlier today complaining about somebody driving in front of me going slow. And I thought to myself, my soul. I just left the house of God. I just preached for 40 minutes, 35 minutes. Had a brief fellowship with everyone. And I'm complaining because somebody's in front of me driving slow. Where the Apostle Paul was ran out of places that he was preaching the Word of God. Where Paul was stoned and dragged to death outside of Lystra. Where he was beaten by his own people down in Tarsus five times. Paul went through so many trials and afflictions nearly every day of his Christian life. Yet he says unto the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8, he says, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of the trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were passed, we were pressed out of measure above strength, insomuch that we despaired even life. I sat back and I thought to myself, the Apostle Paul, even the Apostle Paul, somewhere along the line of the ministry, had a breaking point. Somewhere along the way, there was a point where he was going to break. Now, the Apostle Paul to me, is, is, as most of you know, man, he's a superhero. You can have Superman and you can have Spider-Man, and I like the comics as well. But you can have all the superheroes in the world you want. You can have all the star athletes in the world you want. I'm going to take the Apostle Paul. He is a superhero to me. Outside the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul is about as close as you're going to get to the Superman. You study his life out and the ministry that he had in this world today, and man, one would have to think that the bar is set just way too high. That it's unattainable. That it's almost unimaginable. That's why Paul was saying, for we would not, brethren, have you ignorant. The word ignorant doesn't mean stupidity. It does. It just simply means the lack of knowledge. If I drove down a particular road and I didn't know the rules of the country or the lanes, I would be ignorant to what the speed limit is. In some of these areas where they don't have signs, they've set up provisions for us to know what the speed limit is, and that is street lamps and sign pavements on the, on the road. We know that if it's not posted and there's a, a minimum of two to three street lamps and there's a pavement there, we know that the speed limit is 30 miles an hour unless it is otherwise posted. Now, had we not know that, we would be ignorant. Paul says, I would not have you ignorant. He wanted them to know exactly what he went through. He wanted him to know that, listen, yeah, we were pressed out of measure. We were above strength in so much. He goes, we even despaired even life could say that Paul was at a point somewhere along the way. He said, man, this isn't enough. Man, take my life. Just as the mighty prophet of old sat up underneath that juniper tree. So beloved brethren, there's times when the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's times within the ministry of the church, be it pastor, a missionary, an evangelist, a Christian, a church member, a usher, a, 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 a janitor, a, a piano player, or an organist, whatever it may be, daily Christianity. There's times when one breaks under the pressure. There's times when people will begin to break and carry the load. There's times when the ministry, the care of the churches, care of the sheep, the care of souls, the care of your neighbors, the care of your loved ones, the care of your family members. The care of souls to be saved will push you to the breaking point. And clearly, this is where Elijah was. If you look back in our text tonight there in 1 Kings chapter 19, 
This is where Elijah was. Look here, if you will. He says, For I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. He says, For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. Elijah looked at the miracles. He looked at the works that were done, the sacrifices, the cost, the pain, and yet the reward was minimal at best. Israel was still backsliding. Israel was still continuing to forsake the covenants. Israel was still tearing down the altars of God. And Israel was still seeking to destroy God's men. Elijah is reviewing the requirement. And he's surveying the reward, seeing that at best, only 20% of Israel has remotely obeyed God. And he just spoke from his heart. He just bore where he was. He said, it's enough, Lord. Take my life. Can you understand his predicament where he is? Can you empathize with him tonight? Where Paul was? Can you empathize where Elijah was, sat up under a juniper tree? Can you understand it? Paul understood. You know what Paul said? He said to die is gain. Philippians 1.21 Paul longed for his death. Paul longed to be promoted to the heavenly seat on high. Paul longed to forever be with the Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave him his life and gave his own life for the ransom of the world. But I want you to notice from up top how he prefaced that statement when he says, for me to die is gain. He says, for me to live is Christ. Yes, did I, if I was to die tonight, it would be a promotion on high. If the Lord would have granted Elijah's wish at this present time, it would have been a promotion from on high. Paul and Elijah both looked for the graduation day. They longed to be with God, yet there was a greater cause, a greater reason for them to live in this world. Essentially, we'll fast forward to the New Testament. Essentially, we are looking at the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn, if you will, to me to Matthew chapter 16, if you can get there quickly tonight. Matthew in chapter 16. Matthew in chapter 16 tonight. Again, what we see, the greater reason for them to live, their a greater cause to be in this world, even though they long to be with God, long to be with their Savior, we find the teachings of Christ exemplified in their life. Matthew 16, verse 24, this is what the Bible says, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever shall, or will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what, what, for what is a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall thou give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. We've always assumed that the safest and most secure place in this life to be is in the center of God's will. As a matter of fact, I've said that Thousands of times. Yet the Lord said this in Matthew 10. He said, Behold, I send you forth as sheep. He said, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. And He says, Be ye therefore wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. You see, beloved, those two statements don't line up together, do they? To say, well, the safest place in the world to be is in the center of God's will. And yet Jesus Christ Himself says, hey, I'm sending you forth a sheep in the midst of wolves. So I think I'm just going to take the Scriptures over my own opinion. I think I'm going to take the Scriptures over the man-made teaching of that word that this should be in the safest place in the center of God's will. 
Because friend, there are risks. There are sacrifices. There is loss. There is pain. And there is, serve, uh, there is suffering in serving the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a time when the man of God is going to say, it's enough. There is a time when the woman of God is going to say, man, it is enough. It is a time when children are going to say, it is enough. Take my life and trust me, there is a time. And yes, to die it is to gain, but it is to live is Christ. Friend, the Lord did not promise you and I security. He didn't promise us safety. He didn't even promise us satisfaction. What He did promise, He promised us that we would be sheep among wolves. And what He did promise us is salvation. Sheep are the dumbest animals on the face of the planet. Did you know that? The, the epitome of stupidity is what a sheep is. And that's why I think that's why the Lord likened us unto sheep. He didn't call us lions. He didn't call us tigers and bears and all. He called you like sheep going astray. We need somebody to follow. We need a Lord. We need a guide. We need a shepherd. But they are the dumbest animals alive. They have no ability to defend themselves. They have no speed whatsoever to run away. The only chance of survival that sheep have is to remain close to the shepherd. That's why. We are to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. You see, being wise as serpents is to know where we belong. We as sheep belong as close as we can physically and spiritually get to the shepherd, the great shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. As for Paul, it was the care of the churches that drove him to finish his course. As for Elijah, back in our text there, well, he obeyed the Lord and he stood upon Mount Oreb in the mount of God and he heard a still small voice of God speak unto him. Listen to that. Look, turn back there in your text in 1 Kings 19 and read these few verses with me if you will. 1 Kings 19. Again, I'll repeat myself. As for Paul, it was the care of the churches. That drove him to finish his course. But as for Elijah, well, he obeyed the Lord. He stood upon Mount Horeb, the mount of God, and heard that still small voice. Verse 15 says, And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest to anoint Haziel to be king over Syria, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of, of Abel Mohilah, uh, shalt thou anoint to be the prophet in thy room. It shall come to pass that him that escaped the sword, Haziel shall, uh, Haziel shall Jehu slay. I'm sorry. Escape the sword of Haziel shall Jehu slay. And him that escaped from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Watch this in verse 18. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowed with twelve yoke of oxen. I love that verse. Before him. And he went, uh, he went with the twelve. And Elisha passed by him, cast his mantle upon him. He said, Preacher, what does all that mean? Just as Paul's care for the churches drove him to finish his course. Elijah was driven by the fact that there was yet still 7,000 prophets of God who had not bowed the knee to Baal. Elijah was driven by the fact that, that Ahaziel was going to be their king of Syria. Hey, he was driven by the fact that there was going to be a Jehu there. And he was driven by the fact that someone was going to stand in his place by the name of Elisha who asked him simply, I just want a double portion. Elisha would follow Elijah for eight to ten years until the man of God was taken up into the whirlwind to answering his prayer underneath that juniper tree, take my life, Lord. It's enough. Take my life. God answered that prayer nearly a decade later. And when he took him up in that whirlwind, he took him up in that chariot of fire, at the end of Elijah's ministry, only 20% of Israel still is obeying God. Only 20%. But 
But Elisha would serve the Lord for another 50 years on this earth. Elisha would be born, I mean, would be, would be buried after his, at his death, down in the sepulcher, underneath somehow it had to be like a cavern. And the story would go on that a man, a man's body who would be buried in that same sepulcher was being lowered down. And the decomposed body, the skeletal remains of that old man of God, Elisha, was down there. And that dead corpse just touched the bones of Elisha. The Bible said he jumped back up. I always say this, that Elisha had more life in his dead bones than most men do today behind the pulpits. All blood. Elijah said, just take my life. It needs to be over with now. But ten years would go by and God would bring forth a Hazel and a Jehu and an Elisha. So the question that lies before you and I tonight, are you willing to risk your safety, your security, your satisfaction from the world? Are you willing to lose some weekends? Are you willing to, to take the chance of being hurt? Are you willing to take the risk of going just a little bit further when your heart says, it's enough? With confidence tonight, there may be in this room, there may be on these pavements outside the chapel here, there may be across the street, one of these little homes in the village, there may be in the back on Friday night during youth club, or there may be on Wednesday morning Bible study, or Wednesday night Bible study. Again, I say it may be right here tonight. There may be the next Jehu. There may be the next Haziel. There may be the next Elisha. Which enables us to seek a reward that this world can never provide. It is only offered by Christ truly to die is gain. But to live is Christ. We you bow your heads with me? Father in heaven, again, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be in your house. We pray this evening, Lord, that at which time any of us, and it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, we would reach that breaking point as we've seen so many men reach, which is normal and predictable. We've reached that point to say that it is enough, Lord, just take my life. Let us remember that you can provide a reward, Father, beyond these skies the world can never give. Let us remember that the world is not the place of security, satisfaction, or safety, and especially not salvation. But let us remember, let us be challenged, let us be convicted. That in the midst of those days when we are tempted to say it is enough, that just around us may be the next ones, the next leaders, the next king, the next prophet, the next preacher, the next preacher's wife, the next missionary. Let us live, you Lord. As Paul was driven by the care of the churches, finish his course. As Elijah was driven by Elisha and the Jehu and the Haziels of his ministry, let us too in the Christian walk in the world that you have placed us in this evening, let us be driven to continue on that what may be awaiting in the days to come, the blessed hands of our Lord and Savior, the reward that is eternal, the lives that may be touched, through us, dear God, the body of Christ, remain steadfast for thee. We ask this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.